and particularly working on overseas productions. Is that the, one of the most enjoyable parts of it, seeing the world? When I started to see the world, I realised like how much of the world there is to see and like and how much I enjoyed it. So now I actively try and take the jobs that will jobs let me the see the world. Working on the coronation, how did this opportunity come I up? Think everybody came in through knowing somebody because yeah. it yeah it's such a big event you've got to get it right and you've got to know who you're working with but yeah the greatest thing i've ever done greatest thing you've ever done from radio studio a in media city it's talking salford a podcast where we celebrate the successes of our university alumni it's Lachlan Campbell here as your host for today's episode from our very quiet Media City campus, which that just the other day was massively bustling during summer graduation. So on the podcast so far, you've heard from music producers, documentary filmmakers, public speakers, pioneering arts organisations and journalists. Now we're going to take you into the wide world of television production and all that goes into making a TV show around the world. And to help me do that, a big welcome to Zoe King. Hello. How are we today, Zoe? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm great, and I'm really happy that you're here with us today. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Zoe. So Zoe graduated from our BA Theatre and Performance Programme in 2020, and despite being an actor from very early beginnings, worked as a runner on television sets all through university. It was this experience that landed her a job as a runner on Channel 4's The Bridge in Wales, which was the first UK production shot and released during the COVID-19 pandemic. Zoe then followed that up with jobs on The Voice UK, I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here's Wales series, and progressed to the role of production secretary. In recent years, she's also worked on date and reality show The Courtship, Freeze the Fear with Wim Hof, and the BBC's Race Across the World. She has also worked on Squid Game The Challenge from Netflix, which is one of the biggest reality TV shows ever made, and earlier this year was a production coordinator for the BBC on the coronation for His Majesty King Charles III. Zoe, I would like to start with your time here at Salford. Um, you arrived looking to become an actor and very quickly go down the TV production route. Why did you start doing running in the first place? So Blackboard gave me my first ever opportunity. Um, one of our tutors was making a short film for Sky and just put out the opportunity on there. I signed up not knowing what a runner was. I actually thought I had to run, <laughs> which I wouldn't be terrible <laughs> at. Um, so I yeah, went along and I just got to learn all about behind the scenes, realised there's more than a director, a cameraman and a sound man, um, and just followed that path really I was really intrigued to like learn about everybody's roles um, so then I got some work experience off the back of that and mm -hmm. then just slowly started going down the runner route realising that there was a, like a lot more and like I could use my skills there too um, especially in the production side um, for quite a long time I was looking at casting as well because mm -hmm. um, I quite like talking to people meeting people hearing all their stories yeah. so I was quite torn between if I was going to go editorial or production um, but yeah I, I just found this pathway that I never really knew much about and just really seemed to like and gravitate to straight away when you did these running jobs were they up here in the northwest or did you have to travel quite as a student um no when i was a student everything was manchester a little bit was in liverpool but just down the road or actually every time every now and then i get a welsh job too which mm -hmm. is quite handy just go back home for that but nearly everything was Eccles, media city or just around the manchester area in general and how did you manage to juggle your studies whilst also working on all of these TV programmes? Um, probably use a lot of my reading week that I shouldn't <laughs> have used. Um, but no, like, it would be if, for example, the timetable meant I had, like, an afternoon off on a Friday, um, I'd go see if there was anything that I could do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, like, most weekends I'd try and find any daily jobs. Yeah, and then, yeah, reading week and holidays, really. What was it that just was so appealing to you from the outset? What what was it in that first job that made you think, oh, I want to come back and do this again? I think just being on a professional set was amazing and meeting all these people and all their experiences and seeing what they'd like worked across over like, yeah, some of these people have worked in the industry like 30, 40 years and mm -hmm. had this great experience. So I just really enjoyed meeting the crew more than anything like that was going on, like meeting the crew, hearing their experiences and learning from them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's rewind the clock back to summer 2020. 
a pandemic has just started and it's massively unclear what the future is holding for so many people uh, and you're about to graduate. So talk to me about what was going on for you at that time. Um, so yeah, so we were finishing uni, we finished our final module, which was meant to be quite practical, being theatre, but ended up being a lot online. But to be fair, like Salford just adapted and overcame, we, we dealt with it. Um, but yeah, entering an industry where everything was closing up, like anyone I was... I'd been in contact with over the last three years had no work themselves so there was no way they were going to be able to help me out Um, so it was quite worrying but then I joined like this runners group on Facebook and they put out a post saying they needed somebody in North Wales for three days just running and I was like sound that's me so I went along and they were like oh do you actually want to stay for the shoot which is three months and I was like yeah so I stayed yeah for all the build all the production and then the derig afterwards and it kind of just snowballed from there that was the bridge that was the first one that got like yeah um, developed and made in Covid yeah absolutely I mean when it comes to, when I think back to that time of 2020 when it was when we were going into lockdown and we couldn't really go outside or do anything that must have been quite a cool thing to be able to say oh I'm going to go do this now so <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were like locked in an actual bubble we were caged in barriered into this um space on a reservoir in Wales so all of our food like was cooked like in within the area we lived in these bunker bins which are like shipping containers that have been like pumped out with a bed and a, like a toilet and a bathroom in it um, and yeah we lived there we all just we never left we used to get our shopping delivered the other side of the fence and then it used to wear a hazmat suit and gloves and wipe it all down and then that would be like our shopping deliveries that got delivered that way and it was it was a crazy crazy world but it was amazing because yeah we we spent 24 7 together and we really got to know each other and that that was what was really nice about it like i've made friends that are my friends for life that's a great way i guess to start your first job (laughs) having to cope with that kind of environment and just just cracking on um hazmat suits yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the level we were at at the time because this was before even like the masks were getting introduced and stuff. Yeah. So we didn't, we didn't know, and we didn't want the shoot to get shut down, and we were doing everything we could. So we, oh, yeah, I actually wore a hazmat suit in a caged off little barrier area. I think that's the thing about TV. TV never really stops, no. ever, and the, the demand for TV dramatically increased like in that year because we were all sat around thinking about something that we could be doing with our time and it definitely boomed like so when the restrictions started to lift all of these shows have been in development so for all of like 21 22 mm. it was mad busy like you were just getting phone calls left right and center and you'd finish a job on like a friday and on the monday you'd start something else because you just didn't want to say no to anything so when it came to graduate what were you adamant i'm, not, I'm, not, I'm gonna work in tv i'm gonna be a runner I'm going to make my way in that way. Yeah, like I I still love acting and I still don't like give up on that dream at all. Mm -hmm. But the moment I found this pathway that seems to really be working for me and I'm just going down that path. That's absolutely great to hear. So it's, I think, just just for your first job to have what pretty much is another world experience really in terms of the pandemic. How did it feel then coming out of that and then starting to really try and find your way and kind of the jobs that followed on from that really? Yeah, I think in the industry, every time I say, oh, I started in COVID, everyone's like, oh, you really don't know telly yet then because you've had all of that stress of COVID testing and putting all of that into place. And like now I'm finally seeing, starting to see how you can plan a production without having this whole COVID brain on the side as well, which is quite nice, actually. Um, but yeah, so I, I think as the pandemic like eased Mm. then all the opportunities were there as well because before you were quite restricted and and like now i can travel and like take on these shows that can travel again because all of those type of shows did come to a halt really i think i think i just want to say quickly back to your graduation because you you were it was virtual in 2020 wasn't it but you were able to do it in person properly yeah, yeah. So you could opt to have it virtual in 2020, and I haven't gone through three years of uni to do that. Yeah. So I, I decided to wait. So I had my in-person graduation summer 2022. So yeah, this time last year. And was that with a, quite a lot of your course mates? Nearly everyone. I think everyone just wanted the same experience. Like mm. we waited so long for it, and it meant more than it could have like ever I ever imagined really because yeah like we we just waited so long for it we all really deserved it and it was actually really nice to like 
check in and see everyone and see what they're doing like so many of them are now teachers and it's crazy that everyone's gone on these all different paths mm. and it's really nice to actually share those stories on graduation day because we'd had like two years to go and explore our own pathways I, th- I think that's another example i suppose there's so many examples over the last like three years of that but of just something that probably won't ever happen again where a student class body like graduates years after they're meant to graduate and they've all gone on to do very different things since graduating and graduating with other years as well like the yeah. year below us and the year below that were all there so like you have three years worth and I've never seen Manchester so full in all my life <laughs> well you, you say that I mean I, I was I was volunteering at graduation here just just gone and yeah 4,000 plus people here in Media City it is quite a spectacle to say the least but I think for you yeah um, last year must have been a particularly busy one Um, let's do some myth busting around what a runner is Um, so you you said yourself at the start you thought you were going to be literally running around the place so what are the key things that you would pitch as what if I was running on a production tomorrow what would I be doing do you think so I think first you need to bring with you a bum bag or like a ba- backpack or something just to always have your sharpies ready, have your phone to take notes, um, portable charger so your phone doesn't die. Yeah. Um, and then you just got to be organised and be ready and just be up to solve any problems. So always checking in with the production team and seeing what tasks they can do, mm-hmm. like you can help them with. But also, yeah, checking in on everyone because sometimes the gallery cannot move from their seats for 12 hours. So they need need drinks they need food and it's just good to yeah like look after those people um so yeah so it is like teas and coffees but then it's also it could just be anything like setting up like helping the art department set up like some of the set like um building some cupboards like you you could just do absolutely anything and i think that's it you can't go in there just be like i'm just gonna sit here and wait for somebody to give me a job like you need to be proactive and you Mm. need to be asking and making like yeah putting yourself out there and just ready to take on anything and does it really much change depending on the set? I mean, you, you could be doing, as you say, potentially making tea or coffee one set, but the next day yeah, you're literally helping the setup of whether it's key props or anything relating to what's been shot that day. I think the smaller the production, the more stuff you do, and mm. that's where I learned the most. So although like some of the big like ITV, BBC shows that I've done as a runner were great and uh, great for my CV, but the smaller ones where you only had like two or three runners rather than fifty, you really got to do everything and you got to meet everyone, and they were the ones that actually mean the most and like and helped me build as a person because people sometimes turn their nose up at those jobs, but they're the ones where you actually meet people make connections and you learn all the skills i think when we talked previously you said that on the bridge you met someone as a runner on that set that became quite a key contact for you and in terms of getting work going forward so is the is the key thing about being a runner is you've got to talk to people 100 percent. you can apply for all the jobs in the world and you will get them but nearly i'd say 90 percent of all my work come through somebody I already know and I don't even apply for it they'll just come to me and that's quite nice like that's like the turning point and I think you you have to graft for like maybe like 18 months and like you are sending out a million emails a day and Mm. you just have to put yourself forward all the time but then it gets to the point where the people that you're working with will just naturally take you on their next job with them and that that's quite nice then when you yeah you, you find your people and you all work together again. So you need quite a good networking skill set is what I'm hearing. A hundred percent. Definitely. It's definitely like who you know. And I think Mm -hmm. that's quite scary because I went into this not knowing anyone at all. Like it's like sometimes you hear it's like, oh, my my dad's a sound man and my mum's like on the head of production. But I knew absolutely nobody. And hearing it's who you know was quite scary. But you just get to know these people. You just need to put yourself forward and just need to, yeah, just be confident enough to talk to people and see what they're doing next. Because, yeah, on that first bit of work experience I had, I could have just sat there, just made tea and coffees and sat in the corner the whole time. But I was just naturally talking to people and then it was a cameraman that suggested this different part of work experience and I went on to that and then I spoke with them and they were like, do you want to stay for the rest of the summer and do the rest of the shoot? And it it just naturally goes from that. Like, yeah, the more more you speak to people, the more they'll want to help you as well. What are, like, the things that you've done as a runner that you would never have expected to do before? Um, oh, <laughs> for Britain's Got Talent, I think I bought 500 blow-up 
but like balls and I just went on a mad run around Manchester trying to find anywhere every fancy dress shop anywhere I could think of Poundland all of them just to buy these like yeah big bloke balls to throw into the audience but we had about a three hour deadline to find all of them and I was like okay <laughs> sounds a little bit like when on, I guess on The Apprentice when they get those mad tasks and they have to run around like crazy people for a few hours is that a little bit of what it's like at times a hundred percent like it can be at times but again like you just have to be like okay this is the task let's get on with it rather than like overthinking it just get on with it and yeah just do do your best that's all anyone can ask of you and I quite like where it gets a bit chaotic and it's a bit mad because it's great like and that's where your problem solving skills really come into things yep. I suppose it's kind of like a crash course in problem solving being a rather up production set. I think you're working in TV, it's a crash course in problem solving. That's all you do every day and yeah. I love it, yeah. So so when you became a production secretary, what, what's the... Um, describe to me what that kind of day looks like. What kind of responsibilities do you then take on at that level? Um, so, for example, on Freeze the Fear, I was looking after the runners. Mm-hmm. So there was about... I think about 14 runners Mm -hmm. Um, so like managing their rotors their times and their daily tasks so like you're already like stepping up into like managing a team which is like really nice and yeah I I really enjoy doing that but then at the same time I was like booking the travel for like I think it was about 200 crew so we were flying them everywhere from all over Europe um, into Italy Um, and then you can be looking after accommodation hire cars couriers um, a lot more of the organising and then yeah starting to help with the call sheets but I feel like when I came to coordinate that's when I started to do the call sheets and getting really getting into the planning. You've done so much traveling over the years. I mean, you just mentioned Italy with Freeze the Fear, and it was Canada, was it, with Race Across the World? Yeah. Do you, I mean, it's it's, it's amazing the amount of traveling you get to do working in TV and particularly working on overseas productions. Is that the, one of the most enjoyable parts of it, seeing the world? Definitely, yeah. I think growing up, I I didn't travel, and I remember all of my friends at uni being like, "Oh yeah, after this, like we'll go traveling and we'll do." That. And I was never interested. I was like, "Book me on an all inclusive holiday, and that's the end." But then when I started to see the world, I realised like how much of the world there is to see, and like and how much I enjoyed it. So now I actively try and take the jobs that will jobs let me happen. see the world. Yeah. Um, yeah like just being able to travel with work is is amazing because you do get like the odd down day here and there Mm. and you get to go off and explore and do what you want to do how's your um how's your foreign language speaking shocking shocking (laughs) um i always try and learn a little bit yeah yeah so there's always like a fixer team that will be like in these countries that are fluent in the language and i always try and get them to teach me like one or two words a day so hopefully by the end i can do a little bit that's very (laughs) handy isn't it i mean i love languages but i (laughs) i the the always issue i run into is whenever i'm ordering at a restaurant and i I try particularly in france try and speak in french and they just speak to me in english oh 100 percent and like i've downloaded duolingo so many times and i still can't master it but (laughs) every new year yeah that's the first thing i go to right this year is going to be the year it's um yeah it's one of those things i think learning um a language it it pushes you but it does require a lot of dedication so having fixes on set i I mean i've never heard that that existed before that's quite cool having that asset yeah yeah so yeah every like yeah on all of them actually every every, uh, sorry everywhere you go there's always a fixer or Mm. fixer team um so yeah so in italy there was like a whole team of them and like local just the local knowledge really helps like yeah. you'll just be like oh the laundry place that we research has actually gone bust where can we do everyone's washing and they just know us somewhere and it's just it's honestly washing is one of the biggest problems when you're abroad if people don't have their clothes they go mad so yeah just having this local knowledge all the time or oh there's a problem with the car oh i know a per- so person that can just fix that and yeah it's that the fixer team are absolutely golden on every single shoot I'm going to make an assumption here. Is that harder when you're working with celebrities? Yeah. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we need to go any further than that. Um, We talked about you being able to travel around the world. What are some of the most amazing sites or places that you've seen or just even been able to visit for a day or a few hours? I think my favourite place is a place called Churchill in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it was one place where... 
I wasn't really that bothered about going. It was just on the to-do list. Mm-hmm. And we went there. And you can only get there by either a two-day train or a flight. And the flights are like once every four days. It's so remote. It's in the middle oh, of nowhere. Wow. It's only like one street. It's right on the Hudson Bay. And where you can walk onto the ocean because it completely freezes. So we did that and we watched the sun go down. And that was really, really nice, really special. What was that for? That was on Race Across the World. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like a down day or... Um, we were just filming there, and then yeah. yeah, when all of the teams came into checkpoint, um, we had yeah like thirty six hours with them. So then we all yeah we all went and watched the sunset go down together. Beautiful, yeah, That's beautiful. Because you get the opportunity to work abroad, do you now actively push? I think you said this, but do you actively now push to take on these roles, which are going to be international, where you are going to be out of the country? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it just depends on the show, though, as well. Like I have to really like the show, and mm. re- like it, and it also depends on the team. Like it, I try and work with the same people because I know yeah. how supportive the team are, and the team makes or breaks a show, hundred um, percent. But yeah, I, I definitely like to see the world if if they mention a bit of travel i'm like i'll go on then (laughs) where is some place that you haven't been that you'd love to to do a show on i haven't done any of america so anywhere in north or south america yeah Uh, yeah well anywhere really new york (laughs) la (laughs) la yeah no absolutely no i think that's crazy you haven't been to la yet considering being hollywood being lots of stuff that's done over there at the minute yeah not yet not (laughs) yet no it's on the to-do list yeah um so how, how do you pick your work? Because I guess it must be hard, I guess, being based in the UK, but then thinking about um, kind of planning out your calendar. I mean, I guess when it comes to then booking arrangements with family and stuff, you're like, right, well, I'm going to be out the country for like three months over the summer. Like, how do you manage that with your personal diary? Uh, it's hard. It's it, You have to give everything all the time. And I think s- starting out, I did. Like, every single runner's job, I would miss weddings and holidays and everything. I was just like, booking work all the time but I think now when you get more comfortable into it Mm. you can be like okay I'm going to finish on this job and I am going to take two or three weeks off because I really really need a break and then you'll yeah yeah, you can just like haggle your start dates or everything just always seems to line up really well though I don't I don't know like I'm like touching wood (laughs) because um it but the way it has done I'll come off a job and I've already got another job lined up and I can know if I need a break or not or if I'm fine to go straight into it but because I work in production we have all of the pre-planning first so you're not just getting off one plane and going straight to another you do come back and then you do the planning and then you go out again so it's quite nice does it usually work out working seven, ten day periods and then you have a bit of a break or does it depend on the shoot completely? Uh, so the production start to finish are normally four or five months long because you have the planning, then the shooting and then also the wrap up at the end. Mm. Um, when I'm in the office planning, it is normally five days a week and then when you do the shoot you shoot every day <laughs> every day yeah it, and it just depends on the shoot like you may get to a point where naturally oh you can have an afternoon off or you can have a day off um and yeah but you you love it so it, it doesn't matter because yeah there's so many times where they're like oh we're taking an afternoon off and i'm like i'd rather work because i'm having a great time that that's a pretty cool thing to be able to say about your job i'm not gonna lie Zoe. <laughs> uh, i mean i would be so tired after like seven days and particularly if you're like chasing a bunch of people around and trying to catch up with them whilst they're trying to get a boat somewhere or a plane yeah I, I don't know when I come back then I'm always like okay maybe I need a weekend just to like <laughs> sleep and um, have a bit of a break but uh, yeah I just I don't know the adrenaline kicks in and you just keep going and going and going and for, yeah next thing you know eight weeks has passed by and you didn't even realise I, I think it's I'm so glad we're having this conversation because I, I don't think you could bullet point all of the things that you do when you work in TV because it just seems endless really in terms of the opportunities in terms of the day to day you just yeah and I, th- I think that's it and like you you get this bug and you just want to keep going and that's how you can book your diary up so far yeah. in advance because you're like this sounds great I'm going to sign up for that and you just keep going and the next thing you know you already know what you're doing like this time next year I see so let, let's talk Squid Game the Challenge. Now, this is one of the biggest reality shows ever. I think 456 players from around the world, uh, they've descended on London to do is it all the challenges from the TV show, right? Um, most of the challenges most from the TV show, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all based on the TV show, yeah. And it's to win the jackpot of $4.56 million. I think that's the biggest jackpot ever for a reality show. Mm-hmm. How did you get involved in this? 
Um, again, through people I know. Mm-hmm. So somebody that I worked with on Wim Hof work, was working on Squid Game, and that's a company that also make Race Across the World. So mm-hmm. I was working with that company already. And, yeah, they were like, we, we need some coordinators. Do you want to come on board? And I was like, definitely. Right up my street. And it was something new for me, actually, like working in a studio show. Mm-hmm. I haven't really done that since being a Brenner. So that was also a good um positive for me like w- like not running around on planes and boats and everything and actually being based in a studio and yeah working more with the gallery team and like supporting them and um directors and producers so yeah that was really good learning curve what what was your role during the shoot then so i was on casting mm-hmm. so we all the cast go through like diligence checks okay. um so we were across them like booking their medicals and psych evaluations um for all 456 plus standbys um and then we would also be across their travel so we travel them from all over the world um and then we were part of the cast hotel so they did like a quarantine period as well so we looked after them for their five-day quarantine period um so we were some big babysitters (laughs) those five days um and then yeah we we got them all in and then they started the process and then as they came out we would fly them home and uh, make sure they got their welfare and aftercare before they travelled home as well. Yeah, it sounds like quite an intensive process. How how was the shoot? It, it, yeah, it was intense. It was mm. crazy but again, you just you live off that bug and that adrenaline that kicks in and you absolutely love it every single day. Why do you think people should watch the show when it comes out in November? Oh, well, the Squid Game original was such a big hit and I think this will do just as well, if not better. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I think it was amazing. Like The editorial team were amazing at all the decisions they were making throughout and I think it's very exciting with lots of twists and turns. Lots of twists and turns. Very much like the show then, because I think the show was such a sleeper hit, but it's Netflix's biggest ever show, so it would make sense, I think, then to turn it into a reality show. Is there? Does it kind of feel like it's something which people think they might know how it's going to go, but then it kind of goes very different ways? Oh, yeah, the producers are always one step ahead. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Binge-worthy content, do we think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I'm watching it in one day. <laughs> one day, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let, let's talk about the, the big job that you've done this year, uh, which is working on the Coronation, once-in-a-lifetime gig, um, something you'll be able to tell families and friends about for generations to come. Uh, so you were working with BBC Studios as a production coordinator and focused on audience experience. But how did this opportunity come up? Was it another one of those things where you just knew someone and they got in touch? Yeah, so my um, unit manager on Race Across the World stepped up to line producer on the coronation and then took me with him. So, yeah, um, so again, through somebody that you know. Because I think with the coronation, I don't... Um, I, I don't remember ever seeing anything like that advertised. Mm. I think everybody came in through knowing somebody because yeah. it... Yeah, it's such a big event, you've got to get it right and you've got to know who you're working with. Um, But yeah, the greatest thing I've ever done. Greatest thing you've ever done. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the more surprising things that came about with working on that. Um, So yeah, we're across audience experience, so then I would go to meetings at Buckingham Palace once a week and speak with the royal household, which was crazy. I was like, this little girl in North Wales is now going to the palace (laughs) that she used to visit on her tourist weekends to London, so that was crazy going there. but yeah, like also working with like Ticketmaster, like one of the biggest companies in the mm-hmm. UK, and like dealing with them and um, managing all of the public. So yeah. What was your, what was your main role during the event? Did you, did you start a couple of weeks before the actual like because it was a week of events, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the whole team were across multiple things. So there was a documentary um, about the King growing up. So obviously, it's always been about the Queen, and he's been in the background. So this was all a fresh one, all about him. Um, there was a sing for the King moment. Um, where all um, choirs came together and they performed this piece for the king which they then performed live at the concert Mm -hmm. there was a ceremony itself which had seven and a half hours of live broadcast and then there was the coronation concert which was the day after um, which most of my attention went on the coronation concert Um, so that was audience experience because we had 10,000 members of the public who won a free ticket and then we had 10,000 invited guests and they were invited from the government or the royal household or the BBC so we had 20,000 people <laughs> to look after um, and then we built like this is in the back garden of Windsor Castle by the way mm. uh, so then we built a um, 
like bar and food stalls all all like a little area there and then we had the biggest accessibility platform at a uk event we had loads of other um inclusive um aspects there so we had bsl interpreters Mm -hmm. we had audio description we had sub packs which are these packs that you can wear so if you can't hear the music you can feel the music um and then live on the BBC was also um, BSL and captioning. Sounds a crazy event to get involved in. Um, what, what were the, I guess, like, it must be the job that you guess most proud of working on. Definitely. I remember my first day, we all got taken into this big meeting room at the BBC studios, which even just being in the BBC building um, at White City there was just amazing because you've seen it on telly for so many yeah. years so yeah we all got taken into this big meeting room and we just got told like we're about to make a moment in history and it kind of just sunk in I was like oh yeah we are like you, people will watch these clips again and again and again like how many times have we seen clips of the Queen's coronation we just mm-hmm. know that they'll um yeah that, that was a piece of history and was it something that if you hadn't been given the opportunity initially would you really push to try and work on yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think everybody in the whole TV industry was either trying to do that or Eurovision. Because <laughs> they, they were just the two biggest events like that year. And, well, yeah, yeah. I've seen it so far, yeah. I'm quite glad I got the king, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- th- there must have been some crazy stories from working on that one. Um... It, yeah, it was just more. Oh yeah, we had like we met like loads of the royals. Like they were just at the. Um, we had like an. It wasn't an after party. It was a. What do they call it? After reception. Okay. Yeah. It definitely wasn't a party. It was <laughs> very formal. Um, and yeah, and Will and Kate were just there. And it was like hello. And just so you got you got the chance to just hang out with yeah. the future king and queen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a bit crazy. And then yeah, Katy Perry walked past me, and I was like, oh, <laughs> just Katy Perry. And yeah, there were just big big artists there and sat in Ollie Mercer's dressing room to discuss his tickets for his mum. <laughs> it was just, it was crazy little things like that where you're just like, oh wow, like, I'm actually doing this right now. I think we're going to come on to it in a bit, but you really have met a lot of celebrities in doing what you do. I have, I have, and yeah, I loved them all, it was great and always an experience. <laughs> do you feel like it's something that you're quite comfortable now with, where you see these people in person, you're not so much, I guess most people would feel like they might get a bit starstruck if they're just walking into Ollie Mertz's dressing room, but you feel like, I can do that, yeah, let me do that. I, I don't think I've ever really got that nervous with no. things like that, and I think it's just because we're all there to do a job, like, you're, right. you're there to perform, and mm-hmm. I'm there to make sure that everything goes right so that you can perform, yeah. so, like, I, I will have conversations with many people and it's always just to get a task done because we're all working towards the same goal so I don't know I don't really get to that starstruck I think yeah I think you're very brave as well and I think that definitely helps in terms of dealing with stars and the demands I guess that they place on you um so yeah so working in tv production it you do obviously have to give a lot of your time in order to make it work um so you've obviously been able to do a few things in terms of being able to make a few family occasions and weddings over the years but how how do you see yourself doing this for like the next five ten years do you think you're going to be able to keep this up and be able to kind of really be able to still tour around the world in this kind of position yeah and i think it's got easier the longer it goes on for because when you first start out you don't want to miss any opportunity even Mm. if it just means a day of filming or two days of filming and sometimes the runner contracts could be that they could just literally yeah. be a weekend while now with production yeah my contracts are longer they're four five six months maybe even longer um so now you can make those breaks and know that you've got work lined up and it's fine so i, I can happily take two weeks off knowing that i've got six months like in in the bank so i think it's definitely got easier like as i've gone on and i think it just it will get easier um yeah, yeah, I, I, I am just quite good at balancing my time and my friends know as soon as they're back they like book up my diary straight away and then they do me a little leaving party and I go away again and then I come back again and we do it all again. Your family and friends must be so supportive of you for doing this. They are, they, like, and I think that's it, like, especially my parents, uh, there was never anything they stopped me doing and they'd go above and beyond and I'd be like, oh, sorry, I need to miss your birthday because of this and they're like, go do it, 100%. So, yeah, my my family and friends are really supportive and I think that means the world. I think, I haven't got this question now, but it's come to mind. So, in terms of, like, being, for a runner, so for, for a student that wants to be a runner, what's the best bit of advice you would give them if they were starting? 
start now yeah yeah i so i started the easter of my first year and that was the best thing i ever did because even coming out of it in a pandemic i still managed to find work because my cv was already full and it's, it's like take all the opportunities like there are so many opportunities here like, yeah my first one came from blackboard i don't know if you still have blackboard yeah blackboard okay, yeah. Is still a thing, <laughs> yeah. yeah um so yeah my first came from that and it is it's like get involved in every radio play you can do every everything that somebody is shooting just get involved because mm-hmm. and the, it's the connections you make here as well yeah. because that person can then hire you a year down the line because they're now a sound operator and they've heard on the grapevine that they need a coordinator and it, it all it all works it's all networking and you can network now Fab. so let's do some hot takes then zoe so uh, i gave these to you before we start recording so hopefully you've got some answers <laughs> in the bag for them so uh the tv show that changed your life race across the world race across the world yeah i think i'd like i had already made a lot of connections before i did that job from like the bridge but then i made more there and i think that was the one where everybody trusted me and let me really advance on all my skills um yeah i I think that one and then just seeing the world just made me want to see a bit more of the world why should people watch it because it's great. <laughs> um, because it takes you to places that you've never even heard of. Mm. Um, and I, like, that's what I love. And I think the stories are what really makes it as well. Like, you are really invested in the people that are doing the journey. And you want to learn more about them. And it's just a really wholesome show. I think there's I think there's a lot on telly that can just be, like, in, or out, in and out one ear and the mm. other. But, like, that's, like, a really wholesome show that I could watch time and time again. The nicest celebrity you've met in person? I love Anne and Deck. I mean, oh, to me, Anne and Deck is definitely, I think it's an experience, isn't it, for people? I mean, I, I've, I've never met them. Don't, I don't think I'm ever going to get the opportunity to, but what is it about them that that makes them so nice? They're exactly as they are on telly. Mm. And I first met them as a runner, and they treated me the same as if I was an exec. Yeah. Like, they, it doesn't matter. Like, they genuinely want to meet everybody that's working with them because they're all working to the same goal. So... Yeah, they're, they're just really, really nice. Lovely. And so we've asked this quite a few people on that we've had on the pod so far, but on campus, where was your personal spot where you could either chill, do some work that was just quite personal to you? I love the SU. The student union, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, for a party, but then also just like, it was just a nice area where I meet friends from like societies as well, not just my course. We'd all come together and we'd all just have a nice catch up and just check in on each other. You spend quite a lot of time then. Quite a lot of time. Quite, quite, a, lot of quite time. a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Zoe, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. No problem. And that brings an end to this episode of Talking Salford. So uh, if you like the podcast and you want to keep listening, do subscribe to us wherever you get your pods or do check us out on YouTube if you fancy giving us a watch instead. Um, but until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.